Welcome to University Baptist Church of Starkville, Mississippi. We are an inclusive, diverse, and progressive Christian community of faith, proclaiming the wildly inclusive love of Jesus and seeking to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly together into God's emerging kingdom in this world that God so loves. We hope that you encounter God's wonderful, mischievous spirit moving through our prayers, words, and songs, and in your heart. UBC understands the power that language has to either limit or broaden our understanding and experience of God. While we do not change every reading or hymn in our service, we do try to balance cultural and gender references to include all persons in the worship of God. Please feel free to use inclusive language during worship. That's it. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, welcome to UBC. Um, I've got a few announcements for you. If you're a first-time visitor, if it, so if you're a first-time visitor, there's some visitor cards on the back table back there. I'd like for you to fill one out uh, and give that to us so we can have a record of your attendance. Um, a few things. You'll notice that there's an insert. We have our July giving uh, financial records in there. and. It, a little bit more than usual, our bread. Uh, a bit more usual than our usual monthly spending because we, we went to a, a conference in Dallas. Uh, so usually our monthly expenses are a little bit less than that, but we are a little bit behind, but that's kind of normal for summer. Um, but also, if you're not using your Kroger or if you use Kroger or it's hard to shop with Kroger, go get a little kickback, Lee. You know, if you shop at Kroger and you use your rewards card, you can set it up so it will send uh, a certain amount of money back to UBC every three or four months. So be sure to do that. All the information is there. Um, we are, we do practice inclusive language, and though we don't change everything in our sermons and our scripture reading and pronouns and things like that, we do encourage you to be inclusive in your language to help us expand our understanding of God. Uh, and some have asked about... Uh, coming into our service after not being in church for a long time, they experience some, a little bit of shock or things get triggered. So we've, we've established a, a small group of, of licensed practicing therapists who are willing to talk to you unofficially, not as a practicing therapist, but as a member of this church, to talk about working through any religious and church trauma you may experience. So if, that, if that's something you'd like, you're interested in, let me know, let Sarah Grace know. Uh, and we can connect you with uh, some of those folks in our church who would be willing to talk to you about that for a <coughs> So we can all experience some healing. And not 
this coming Wednesday, Wednesday after that, August 17th, we're going to return to Wednesday night Zoom shares and prayers. In two weeks, let me back up. Next week, which is not in your book, so if you've got a pen, you want to write it down. My pen's up there. Next week, um, we've been invited by Trinity Presbyterian Church at 5.30 in the afternoon, to, next Sunday afternoon, to go to their church for a pancake supper, followed by, at 6 o'clock, a Bob Dom drum circle. Um, so we've all been invited to participate at 5.30 if you want to have some pancakes and sausage, 6 o'clock if you just want to get your groove on with the drum circle. Um, let's see, anything else? So, and then in two weeks, we'll have baptism and pool party at Ruth's pool, actually Ruth's brother's pool, on Bridal Path. Uh, Brennan Lewis and Elijah Jones are being baptized, and then we'll have pizza and just a swimming party after. So we'll have church here, we'll have worship here, and then we'll just kind of mosey on over there if you want to run home and change into your swimsuit, whatever you do that, or carry it with you and change. Uh, and then we'll meet there about 12, 15-ish. We'll have a hymn, a prayer, we'll do some baptisms, and then we'll let the party begin. Um, Linda, do you have anything to say about our strong neighbors work? I'm just uh, continue to remind, I want to continue to remind you um, think about that when you're shopping at the grocery store to pick up um, uh, most easily would be non-perishables like cereal, uh, school snacks, things like that, any a can, canned food item. Um, but if you want to do something else, let me know. But I can I can get food from you and see the family immediately. You're very appreciative, and I think we're really making a difference in this family's life. And, and this is through Starful Strong, and I got an invitation last night from, from Kate, who is in Memphis tonight, today, uh, to remind you that they've been posting, you may have seen this on Facebook, Start, you can't see this, Starful Strong has committee interest meetings. So for the next few days, they're going to invite anybody and everybody from the town to come, and let's set up groups that are willing to do things and help make more things happen in our community. So I'm going to set this back there, and I've got a, a QR code. You can scan this, and we'll take you straight to the website, and you can learn about some of the things that they're doing and what they're looking for in volunteers and ways that we can partner with Starful Strong uh, in the coming days and weeks. And finally, um, our quarterly reflections, uh, daily diversion journal is back there. These are very good. A lot of people that a lot of us know personally write for them. Diana Bridges, our founding member, Diana Bridges has worked, uh, written for them, I've written for them before. So this is, this is good stuff, and I would recommend it. If you're looking for, for good, thoughtful, daily devotions, I invite you to do that. And finally, I do have a change in the order of worship. I've noted that um, musical meditation and offertory music are George and Lee Graham, which if you are fans of our local music scene, as I know you all are, you know them as the holograms. So this should be listed as the holograms with special guest Jerry Carnathan. But all that has changed in the window overnight because Jerry and Lee are in a, in a power trio together, think James Gay, and, 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 and they brought in their drummer, John Staggers. Thank you. So now, rather than being holograms with Jerry Carnathan, it is now Flathead Ford with Georgia Graham. So, and if you're not paying attention to our local music scene, Johnny Red, I mean, you guys are missing Sugar High. I mean, come on. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance. And now, um, I believe the Hollises are coming forward.
surprising God of mercy and love, thank you for calling to us this day. You lead us to show our faith in ministries of peace and justice, offering compassion to all in need. Open our hearts and minds today to hear your words of encouragement and challenge. We offer this in prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Who shall make standing for our opening hymn? Hey, y'all. Uh, turn to hymn 341, please, for the beauty of the earth. Meetings for that, 
I hate them. You've worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I'll not be listening. And do you know why? Because you've been tearing people to pieces and your hands are bloody. Go home and wash up. Clean up your act. Sweep your lives clean of all your evil doings so I don't have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. Go to bat for the defenseless. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's turn to page 268, Bond of Love. We'll sing one verse. The state of sing. Sing it through twice. Yes. Eyes on the prize. Hold on. 
Trust me when I tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet, because I know what they're doing next. <laughs> they just get warmed up. I'm reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40, from the first egalitarian translation. And as I read from this Holy Scripture, listen for God's word for you. Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it has pleased your heavenly Father to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give money to the poor people. Make purses for yourselves that don't wear out, treasures that will not fail you. In heaven, where thieves cannot steal and moths cannot destroy, for wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Be dressed and stay ready, and keep your lamps lit. Be like a household staff that's awaiting the owner's return from a wedding feast, so that when the owner arrives and knocks at the door, you'll open the door without any delay. It will go well for those staff members whom the owner finds wait, awake and waiting, waiting for him upon his return. I tell you the absolute truth, Jesus says, the owner will put on an apron. The owner will seat them at the table and proceed to wait on them. Now should the owner happen to come at midnight or before sunrise and he finds them prepared, it will go very well for them. Understand this, though. No homeowner who knew when a thief was coming would have let, would have let the thief break in, would he? So be on guard. Be on guard. The promised one will come when you least expect it. This is the word of God for all the people of God. I do have a lengthy section that I have cut out and saved for another sermon comparing the coming of Christ when you least expect it to Monty Python's Spanish Inquisition. That'll be up for another sermon. And then you'll have to come back. Okay. Surprise and fear. Nice red, red robes. All right. In the, early, in the early part of the last century, just after the First World War, during the Roaring Twenties, there was a small cult-like religious group up in New York City called the Outer Court of the Order of the Living Christ. Genevieve Ludlow Griscom was one of their true believers. And it's always good in your cult if you've got a true believer who happens to be married to a wealthy business executive which she was. She built a mansion, mansion on the hill. She built a mansion in what is said to be the second highest peak in all of New York City. But she did not live in the mansion. No, she and the other 30 or so members of the group lived in very simple, basic cottages and even shacks <coughs> on the grounds that surrounded the mansion. Genevieve built the mansion for Jesus. The outer court of the order of the living Christ knew something that the rest of the entire world did not. That Jesus was not only about to return any day, Jesus was going to return in their day. And he was coming to set up his kingdom right there with them. Are you ready? In the Bronx. <clears throat> 15,000 square feet. 15,000 square feet. Staff quarters. <coughs> 17 rooms, a conservatory, a library, a lounge, a billiard room. You can make your own rapture edition of clue board game jokes yourself. In the late 1950s, over 30 years, over 30 years of waiting patiently for the Lord to come, Genevieve passed away. 
some of the other older folks passed on, and the outer court of the order of the living Christ ceased to be. The mansion, however, still stands. Just in the last decade, it sold for over $10 million. Today, it also includes a fitness center, a hot tub, a home theater, a barbecue pit inside the kitchen, and of course, a wine cellar. And for smart, they know just to keep it stacked with bottles of water. <laughs> In Luke's gospel text, Jesus invites us to imagine that we are like the staff, the staff of a big mansion. And like that household staff, we are waiting for the master to return from a wedding feast. And we should stay dressed in our servant clothes. Okay. Keep our lamps lit so we can see where we're going any time of the <laughs> night. And ready to open the door and ready to serve the master whenever the master arrives. And then Jesus <laughs> changes the imagery a little bit and says, hey, imagine a burglary. If you knew you were going to be burglarized, you would be ready. You'd be waiting. You'd confront and scare off the burglar, right? And Jesus says, be alert. Stay ready. Because the promised one can come at any time, suddenly, without warning, like a thief in the night. Now, how in the world? Someone determined that this meant Jesus would come back specifically in the roaring 20s or the early 30s, specifically in the United States, specifically in the Bronx, and want and need a luxurious 15,000 square foot mansion. <sighs> Do you ever wonder how in the world some people approach the same holy scriptures as we do? And yet, Get it all so wrong. Let's leave this here for a moment. Let's visit that text from Isaiah that Sarah Grace read just a few minutes ago. Isaiah conjures up in the minds of his listeners with just one quick passing reference. You might have missed it when she read it. Calls up in their minds the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And with those words, we need to ask ourselves, how is it that we can approach the same Holy Scriptures as other people throughout the world and somehow manage to get it all so very wrong? <clears throat> the original story of Sodom and Gomorrah is found in the book of Genesis, as you quite know. It involves Lot, not a Lot, a person named Lot, who is Abraham's son. Abraham is in the story in the background, in the larger context. It involves some angels who come to visit Lot, who take the form of strangers, seeking hospitality, and visit Lot as men. And it involves a violent, rabid, lustful mob, determined to show that this is their land and exert their brute force on those visitors by raping them, humiliating them, like a prison movie when the old guy wants to show who's the boss to the new prisoner. Oh, and then there's the, the element of Lot offering his two young sweet virgin daughters to Lot. Do what you will with these people. They're not even people. They're women. Men, women don't count, right? But don't. Don't hurt my, my prison men, friends. But the mob refused. Because it wasn't quick, easy, consensual sex they were after. It was simply a tool of humiliation to show dominance and to let these strangers know, you ain't welcome here. You boys ain't from around here, are you? It might help when we get confused about what kind of sex Sodom and Gomorrah is about. It might help for some of us who are older to imagine that they need deliverance. Or perhaps if you're a bit younger, Bruce Phillips in Pulp Fiction. If you don't know those, you know, see me afterwards. Anyway, friends, Sodom and Gomorrah has nothing to do with people being gay. 
being greedy, being lustful, being power hungry, being violent, being selfish and hateful and unwelcoming, completely inhospitable, destroying people sadistically for the fun of it. Yes, that's what the story is about. But even more so, it is about the gross, obscene inequalities of wealth and power that foster such greed and lust and selfishness. Isaiah is speaking to God's people, and it was just a passing, hey, you Sodom people, you people schooled by Gomorrah. He called Gomorrah, he calls into their minds the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, simply by mentioning the names, and he places them upon his audience, and they know what it is. You think you're so godly with the best worship services your money can buy, with your proudful and very public display, displays of your faith and your sacrifices, comparing your sacrifices to what they're sacrificing. Well, I sacrifice something with more value. Convincing yourself that you are more loved by God while everyone else is obviously a little less deserving of God's love. And all the while, finding more and more ways to funnel increasing amounts of wealth into the hands of fewer and fewer people, even while dipping your hands, your self-righteous hands, into the pots, the almost hip, empty pots, to steal what little money is in there that would be used to provide basic food, clothing, and shelter, and hope, and life to the masses of God's beloved children. Another, another prophet, Ezekiel, says it as clear as day in case anybody wants to get it wrong still. Ezekiel says, these are the sins of Solomon. Pride, gluttony, obscene wealth, extreme excess, the laziness and arrogance of, of luxury. While masses of people around you are being exploited, oppressed, used, abused, dehumanized, and ignored. And then Isaiah, Isaiah is bringing all that up, and, and like a, a relief pitcher, getting on the mound. He's about ready to throw that false fire strike. He throws it back at him. You are Sodom and Gomorrah. Man, we sure get Sodom and Gomorrah wrong, don't we? Okay. Let, let's get back to, to the text about Jesus and Luke's gospel. Before we start getting too carried away about the outer court of the order of the living Christ, we may change our name to my <laughs> We need to take a good look at what so many of us have been taught <laughs> to believe about Jesus' return. Because we are just as prone to get that oh so very wrong. Listen closely, friends. The rapture is not a term that is ever used in the Bible. The rapture is not found in any original Greek text of the New Testament. Nor does the rapture exist in over 90%, over 90% of Christian and church history. For 1,800 years of the 2,000 years of church history, it doesn't exist. The very particular, peculiar view of scripture and Christian faith that we know as the rapture emerged right here in the good old U.S. of A. in the mid-1800s, around the time of the Civil War. So all the time from Jesus and, and Jesus' life and death and resurrection and Paul's missionary journeys around the world up into our civil war, 90% of church history, it doesn't exist. So let's take another look at the stuff Jesus says. But let's start with those verses before the workers, the staff at the mansion waiting on the keeping their lamps lit. Let's start in the passage this verses before Jesus talks about burglarizing houses. 
Jesus talks about treasure. Jesus talks about our stuff. Where our stuff is, where our resources are poured into, where our financial commitments and priorities are. There, there are treasures. Our hearts and our lives are so intimately entangled with our money and what we do with our stuff. Do you know that study after study after study shows that the wealthier people get, the less generous they are? Likewise, study after study after study shows that the less wealth people have, the poorer people are, the more they are willing to freely share what little they have. Put Jesus and Isaiah together for a moment, and we see the same consistent theme that flows throughout our Holy Scriptures from beginning to end, that no matter how million, many millions of dollars we may raise to erect a cross along the highway, or how many beautiful houses of worship that we keep locked and protected and safe and empty for most of the week, when they all sit in the midst of children and families who have no food in their cabinets, when they look out over dilapidated apartments and unsafe houses being rented by absent and uninterested landlords, all the while the same people who are sitting in the comfortable pews, boasting proudly of their faith, enjoying the best service of worship service their money can buy, and they spend the other six days of the week figuring out how to get more and more money into their bank accounts, even if it means denying things to other services, health care, literally stealing money from the poor. If I wasn't a Baptist preacher, I'd be shaking my head and saying, damn! But I am a Baptist preacher, so withdraw that. <laughs> I invite you to imagine Jesus and Isaiah, in fact, all the great prophets, Summarizing everything that they have just said and all the things throughout our scriptures, scriptures, I invite you to imagine Isaiah and Jesus giving their speech and them summarizing it all by shaking their head and saying, damn, y'all. Sorry, man. <laughs> now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Jesus is not going to return and make all things new. I'm not saying that. Like we read in the very hopeful book of Revelation. Revelation is a hopeful book. It's written for oppressed people being downtrodden and exploited by the violent empire. Not a fear and loathing story to scare the hell out of you. Anyway, in the hopeful book of Revelation, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And God will come, God will come and live among the people here. And there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more exploitation, no more injustice, no more suffering. And the lion will lie down with the lamb, and the slumlord will sit at the same table as his evicted tenant, and the rocket ship drag racer will sit side by side with the starved immigrant child from the world. But Jesus coming again, in the Gospels and through the New Testament has never been about a small group of righteous people being taken away from the world, escaping from the world, being snatched up in the blink of an eye and taken away while everyone else left behind is here to endure unspeakable suffering with pain and devastation and death that they so rightly deserve. That's not what it is in our scripture. In Luke's context, where our treasure is, all that stuff, in the larger context of the Gospels, especially in Matthew 25, Jesus does return. Jesus returns again and again and again and again, day after day, year after year. Jesus returns to us and every person that we meet, 
Jesus says, returns to us, especially in foreigners and strangers and outcasts and excluded and poor, like the strangers, angels, strangers, humans, victory, sorrow to visit God. Jesus comes to us again and again in everyone whom we just think we observe, we assume deserves what they are experiencing. You are the deserving poor. You're too lazy. You're too dumb. You don't, you don't work hard enough. Everyone we see as not worthy of our time and our energy, everyone we think of as not worthy of God's love, like the angels who visited Lot, Jesus returns to us. And are we sovereign in the world? It all depends on how we treat others. But, We're watching. If we're not waiting for Jesus to come like a deus ex machina in the sky and take us all away, but we're looking and expecting Jesus to come anywhere, anytime when we least expect it, we stay dressed, we keep our maps lit. We'll meet Jesus day after day, again and again in every one we encounter along our path. So keep your lamps trimmed and burning. For this old world of greed and corruption is going to pass away. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning because Jesus' kingdom is emerging wherever people are doing justice, loving mercy, and walking in love. Thanks be to God.
asked me at this time if you wish to make a public commitment of faith to move your membership to UBC. We're doing a baptism in a few weeks, and if you wish to be baptized at Ruth's pool, let me know. Um, but however you need to respond, how do you need to keep your lamps trimmed and burning and looking for Christ this week? Let's stand and sing hymn number 590, all verses of the solid rock.
And they'll know 